right, so let me take this opportunity to say good evening again to all of you and welcome to the Juneteenth, uh, a fight of freedom and through words, as, through spoken word and poetry and through various acts. Tonight's performances will be a mixture of both video performances and live performances and we're glad that you are joined us tonight as we uh, look around and are reminded uh, often on daily news of the struggles that we still face uh, through various uh, ways of racial injustice, violence, economic, and even social challenges and structural oppression, we invite you tonight to recommit to the fight, to recommit to the fight of freedom, and to recommit to the fight of justice. It's a promise that this country has never lived up to, but one that we can no longer walk away from. And so I invite you again to recommit to the fight. And if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? If you're ready to get started, say a shay. All right. So Journal of Truth was one of the most famous of the 19th century's black woman orators. Born into slavery in New York and freed in 1827 under the state's quadruple Quadral, excuse me, emancipation law, she de dedicated her life to abolition and the struggle for equal rights for women and men. Scholars agree that Ain't I Woman was given at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio on May 29, 1851. There is much debate about what Truth said and how she said it. The most quoted version in the Salem, Ohio anti-slavery uh, published is rendering of true speech on June 21st, 1851, within a month of her presentation. So many historians believe it to be the more accurate account, since no written transcript of the speech has appeared, the exact words truth actually spoke will probably never be known. Ain't I a woman? Sojourner Truth, 1851, presented by Marie St. Clair. Read the wrong paper. <laughs> Thank you so much. They are funny. <clears throat> well, children, where there's so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women of the North all talking about rights, the white man will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there <laughs> says women need to be helped into carriages, lifted over ditches, and to have the best, best places everywhere. <laughs> Nobody ever helped me into no carriage, or over a mud puddle, or give me any of the best places, and ain't I a woman? Look at me, look at my arms. I've plowed and I've planted and I've gathered into bonds and no man could head me. Ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lashes well. Ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen the most all sold off to slavery and when I cried a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. Ain't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. Um, what's that thing called? Intellect. Intellect, yeah, that's it, honey. <laughs> what's that got to do with women's rights and Negroes' rights? If my cup won't hold a pint and yours holds a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? Then that little black man in the back over there, he, <laughs> he say women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did he get Christ from that? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with it. In the first, if the first woman ever made was strong enough 
to turn the world upside down, these women gathered here ought to be able to turn it back and right side up. And now they asking to do it. And the men better let them. Now I'm gonna go take my seat now. Old Sir Jonah ain't got nothing more to say. Yes, all of your claps, applauses, and snaps are free tonight, so don't be afraid to give them away. Let's give Sister Marie St. Clair another hand. <laughs> Frederick Douglass, born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, around February 1817 or 1818, was an African-American social reformer, abolitionist, orator, writer and statesman. On July 5th, 1852, Frederick Douglass was invited to address the citizens of his hometown, Rochester, New York. Whatever the expectations of his audience on that 76th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Douglass used the occasion not to celebrate the nation's triumphs, but to remind all of its continuing enslavement of millions of African. Frederick Douglass, What to a Slave is the 4th of July, presented by Reverend Kevin Swan, pastor of the Ivy Baptist Church. Dolly Talk, Mayor of the City of Hampton, Virginia. We the people, the City of Hampton, Virginia. We the people, in order to I'm Dr. Eric Fidel, and I'm reading an excerpt from W. Hello, everyone. My name is Kara Dixon, and I'm a reporter with Wavy TV 10. Today, I will be reading a portion of Lynching Our National. Hello, I'm Kevin Swan, pastor of Ivy Baptist Church in Newport News, Virginia. I am standing on the hollow grounds of Hampton University and right behind me is the historic Emancipation Hall. Today, I will be sharing with you the hypocrisy of American slavery that was shared by Frederick Douglass on July 4th, 1852. There's not a man beneath the canopy of heaven who does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What? Am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them with outrageous to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters. Must I argue that a system marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I would not. I have better employment for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine? That God did not establish it? That our doctrines of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in the thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? That they can, I cannot. The time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability, could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of abiding ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be sorrowed. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be denounced. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year. The gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. 
To him, your celebration is a shame. Your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your shouts of liberty and equality are hollow and mock. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parades and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impropriety, hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There's not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than there are of the people of these United States at this very hour. Go search where you will. Roam through all the monarchies and deposits of the old world. Travel through South America. Search out every abuse. And when you have found the last, lay your backs by the side and everyday practices of this nation. And you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America is without a rival. Thank you. All right. In his absence, we can give Ferrum Swan another hand as well. <laughs> Bury me in the free land, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. Francis Ellen Watkins Harper was an abolitionist and poet born free in 1825 in Baltimore, Maryland. She was the first African-American woman to publish a short story, but she was also an influential abolitionist, suffragist, and reformer that confounded the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. I'm sorry. It's Dr. Alexander Present. Is that better? All right, can you hear me good? All right. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander will also be by video with us in this performance. I'm Cassandra Newby Alexander, and I'm reading a poem entitled Bury Me in a Free Land by Francis E.W. Harper. And this particular point, written in 1858, was actually, has been used by many people during the Juneteenth celebrations because of the content of the poem and the meaning and the relevance that it has to that particular celebration. Make me a grave wherever you will, in a lowly plain or lofty hill. Make it among Earth's humblest graves, but not in a land where men are slaves. I could not rest if around my grave I heard the steps of a trembling slave. His shadow above my silent tomb would make it a place of fearful gloom. I could not rest if I heard the tread of a coffle gang to the shambles led, and the mother's shriek of wild despair rise like a curse on the trembling air. I could not sleep if I saw the lash drinking her blood at each fearful gash. And I saw her babes torn from her breast like trembling doves from their parent nest. I'd shudder and start if I heard the bay of bloodhounds seizing their human prey. And I heard the captive plead in vain as they bound afresh his galling chain. If I saw young girls from their mother's arms bartered and sold for their youthful charms, my eye would flash with a mournful flame, my death-pale cheek grow red with shame. I would sleep, dear friends, where bloated might can rob no man of his dearest right. My rest shall be calm in any grave 
where none can call his brother a slave. I ask no monument, proud and high, to rest the gaze of the passers-by. All that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. The next video you will see features the Honorable Will Moffat and was recorded a year ago as Mr. Moffat stood on this very stage to present it himself. Will Moffat has now transitioned. However, we honor him and honor how much he loved the city of Hampton and served the city of Hampton, starting as a young activist, later serving on city council, where he fought tirelessly for the citizens of Hampton, Virginia, and the greater Hampton Roads area. July 4th, 1776, is recognized as America's Independence Day. However, blacks were still enslaved. Although President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, which freed enslaved people in the United States currently engaged in rebellion against the Union, many blacks considered June 19, 1865 as our Freedom Day. On that day, General Gordon arrived in Galveston, Texas and told the enslaved that the war was over and they were now free. the reading of an excerpt from the Emancipation Proclamation by the Honorable Mr. Will Moffin. And it goes thus, that on the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then this void, and forever free, and the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority, therefore thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no, no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. Thank you. The introduction there to that video was provided by Gabe Diaz and obviously the Honorable Will Moffitt. At this time, I'd like to invite to the stage uh, Candace St. Clair, Deborah Harris, and Marie St. Clair. <laughs> On June 19, 1865, enslaved people in Galveston, Texas learned of their freedom two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. On June 19, 1865, General Gordon Granger read General Order 3, which proclaimed all enslaved people were free. The poems, Now Believe This Freedom Come My Way, and the song, Now That I Am Free, were written from the perspective of these newly freed people. Candace St. Clair, Deborah Harris, and Marie St. Clair. Good evening. Good evening. The title of the poem I'm going to read is called Believe This, and it was written by Marie St. Clair. People gather around to hear this. You're not even going to believe this. Just yesterday, cattle nine on my back for this. Blood running down my back for this. Now the time has come to this. June 19th, 1865 is this. Thank God we stayed alive for this. We get absolute equality for this personal rights and property with this. General order number three is this. We've been done set free with this. Now what we gonna do with this? Be free. We've been emancipated and let go with this. Set free to go on our way with this. Now what we gonna do with this? 
Let's celebrate and be free with this. What we gonna be called with this? Free. free. Which road should I take? What path will I make? Now that I am free, which way should I go? My Lord only knows. Now that I am free, now that I'm free, now that I'm free, now that I am free, with Christ as my God and love by my side, now that been set free, and before I be a slave, I'd rather be dead in my grave, now that I am free. Yesterday I had a whip on my back, mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing is called Freedoms Come My Way, also by Marie St. Clair. <laughs> <laughs> Freedoms come my way. No more of the frustrations working on Mass's plantation. Freedoms come to stay. I slaved in his fields. Now I work by my own will. Freedoms come today. They promised to give us 40 acres and a mule. I'm going to even build me my own school. Freedoms come my way. Yes. I ain't even got to wear shoes on my land. Mm -mm. Each grain of dirt I want to hold in my hands. Freedoms come to stay. The way I figure, I hope I can count on what he said. He's a soldier, an honorable man, not some ignorant overseer working on somebody else's land. Owning land is the meaning of power. Now is the time, the place, and the hour. Freedom done wrapped itself all around me, running all through my body, breaking the chains that bound me. I never could dream of what happened today. Freedom, yes, freedom, done come my way. Freedom come my way. Yeah. That's it. You ought to cry loud and cry long. Cry loud and spare not. Freedom come my way. And before I be a slave, I'd rather be dead in my grave. Freedom come my way. Our next performance tonight is uh, by Ida B. Wells. By 1909, Ida B. Wells was the most prominent anti-lynching campaigner in the United States. 
Starting in the early 1890s, she labored mostly alone in her efforts to raise the nation's awareness and indignation about these usually unpunished murders. Wells delivered the following speech at the National Negro Conference, forerunner to the NAACP, which was held in New York City from May 31st through June 1 of 1909. Kara Dixon joins us by way of video with lynching our national crime, Ida B. Wells 1909 speech. Hello everyone, my name is Kara Dixon and I'm a reporter with Wavy TV 10. Today I will be reading a portion of Lynching Our National Crime by journalist and activist Ida B. Wells. Proof that lynching follows the color line is to be found in the statistics which have been kept for the past 25 years. During the few years preceding this period and while frontier law existed, the execution showed a majority of white victims. Later, however, as law courts and authorized judiciary extended into the far west, Lynch law rapidly abated, and its white victims became few and far between. Just as the Lynch law regime came to a close in the west, a new mob movement started in the south. This was wholly political, its purpose being to suppress the color vote by intimidation and murder. Thousands of assassins banded together under the Ku Klux Klan's Midnight Riders, Knights of the Golden Circle, etc., etc., and spread a reign of terror by beating, shooting, and killing colored people in a few years. The purpose was accomplished, and the black vote was suppressed. From 1882, in which that year 52 colored people were lynched down to the present, lynching has been along the color line. Mom murder increased yearly until in 1892, more than 200 victims were lynched, and statistics show that 3,284 men, women, and children have been put to death in this quarter of a century. During the last 10 years, from 1899 to 1908, Inclusive, the number lynched was 959. Of this number, 102 were white, while the colored victims numbered 857. No other nation, civilized or savage, burned its criminals. Only under that stars and stripes is a human holocaust possible. 28 human beings burned at the stake, one of them a woman and two of them children, is an awful indictment against American civilization, the gruesome tribute which the nation pays to the color line. The Niagara Movement was a civil rights group created by W.E. Du Bois and William Monroe Trotter in 1905 after being denied interest into the hotels in Buffalo, New York. The Niagara Movement was dedicated chiefly to attacking the platform of Booker T. Washington. William Edward Burghardt Du Bois was an American sociologist, socialist, historian, and pan-Africanist civil rights activist. Dr. Eric Clavel, I believe, joins us with the Niagara Movement speech, W.E. Du Bois, mm, by video as well. Thank you. I'm Dr. Dr. Eric Cavell, and I'm reading an excerpt from W.E.B. Du Bois, Men of Niagara, 1906. The men of the Niagara movement, coming from the toll of a year's hard work and pausing a moment from the earning of a daily bread, turned toward the nation and again asked again in the name of 10 million that the privilege of a hero. In the past year, the work of a Negro hater has flourished in the land. Step by step, the defenders of the rights of American citizens have retreated. The work of stealing the black man's ballot has progressed, and the 50 and more representatives of stolen votes still sit in the nation's capital. Discrimination in travel and public accommodation has so spread that some of our weaker brothers are actually afraid to thunder against color discrimination as such and are simply whispering for ordinary decencies. Against this, the Niagara Movement eternally protests 
who will not be satisfied to take one jot or title less than our full manhood rights. We claim for ourselves every single right that belongs to a freedom of free born America, political, civil, and social. And until we get these rights, we will never cease to protest and assail the ears of America. The battle we rage is not ourselves alone, but for all true Americans. It is a fight for ideas, lest this, our common fatherland, false to its founding, become in truth the land of the thief and the home of the slave, a viable and a hissing among the nations for its sounding pretensions and pitiful accomplishments. Never before in modern age has a great and civilized folk threatened to adopt so cowardly a creed in the treatment of his fellow citizens born and bred on his soul, stripped of his verbiage and subterfuge and his naked nastiness. The new America creed says, fear to let the black man even try to rise, lest they become equals of the whites. And this is the land that professes to follow Jesus Christ, the blasphemy of a such, a course is only matched by its cowardice. Mary McLeod Bethune, what does American democracy mean to me? Mary Jane McLeod Bethune was an American educator philanthropist, a humanitarian, womanist, and civil rights activist. Bethune founded the National Council of Negro Women in 1935. The speech presented today, Bethune reminded her listeners that African Americans had always been willing to die for American democracy, but were still shut out from its promise of freedom. Delivered by Superintendent Dance, what, what does American democracy mean to me, 1939? This will also be a video presentation. Greetings, my name is Yola Dance, and I serve as the superintendent at Fort Monroe National Monument. I join you as we discuss triumph and tragedy in the African-American experience on the road to Juneteenth. Today, I will share with you an excerpt from Mary McLeod Bethune's What Does American Democracy Mean to Me? Democracy is for me and 12 million Black Americans, a goal towards which our nation is marching. It is a dream and an ideal in whose ultimate realization we have a deep and abiding faith. For me, it is based on Christianity, in which we confidently entrust our destiny as a people. Under God's guidance, in this great democracy, we are rising out of the darkness of slavery into the light of freedom. Here, my race has been afforded the opportunity to advance from a people of 80% illiterate to a people of 80% literate, from abject poverty to the ownership and operation of a million farms and 750 homes, from total disenfranchisement to participation in government from the status as chattel to recognize contributors to the American culture. As we have been extended a measure of democracy, we have brought to the nation rich gifts. We have helped to build America with our labor, strengthened it with our faith, and enriched it with our song. We have given you Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Booker T. Washington, Marion Anderson, and George Washington Carver. But even these are only the first fruits of a rich harvest, which with, which with 
we reap when new and wider fields are open to us. The democratic doors of equal opportunity have not been opened wide to the Negro. In the Deep South, Negro youth are offered only one fifteenth of the educational opportunity of an average American child. The great masses of Negro workers are depressed and unprotected in the lowest levels of agriculture and domestic service. While the black workers in industry are barred from certain unions and generally assigned to more laborious and poorly paid work, their housing and living conditions are sordid and unhealthy. They live too often in terror of the lynch mob are deprived too often of the constitutional rights of suffrage and are humiliated too often by the denial of civil liberties. We do not believe that justice and common decency will allow these conditions to continue. Our faith envisions a fundamental change as mutual respect and understanding between our races come in the path of a spiritual awakening. Certainly there have been times when we may have delayed this mutual understanding by being slow to assume a fuller share of our national responsibility because of the denial of full equality. And yet, we have always been loyal when the ideals of American democracy have been attacked. We have given our blood in its defense from Christmas attics on Boston Commons to the battlefields of France. We have fought for the, de the, the democratic principles of equality under the law, equality of opportunity, equality at the ballot box, for the guarantees of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have fought to preserve one nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Yes, we have fought for America with all her imperfections, not so much for what she is, but for what she can be. Perhaps the best or the greatest battle is before us, the fight for a new America, fearless, free, united, morally rearmed, in which 12 million Negroes, shoulder to shoulder with their fellow Americans, will strive that the nation under God will have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, for the people, and by the people, shall not perish from the earth. This dream, this idea, this aspiration, this is what American democracy means to me. Thank you. Ms. Jocelyn Best is going to favor us with a civil rights song, and immediately following her, we shall hear from Mr. James Baldwin. On Cambridge University in 1965, James Baldwin, a prominent writer and the leading voice of the civil rights movement, debated William F. Buckley, America's most influential conservative intellectual on the topic, the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. Each man was allotted 15 minutes to make his argument. Baldwin argued that the evils of slavery had hardly been exercised from aboli after abolition, but, ra but that rather the country was essentially still the same for black Americans as it was during the days of legal slavery. After he spoke, he received a standing ovation. The evening, this evening, we present an excerpt from the debate. Just a side note, the vote was 544 to 164 in favor of Baldwin. Ms. Jocelyn Best leads us, and then we shall hear from Mr. James Baldwin, presented by Luce.
my heart I do believe who we shall overcome Midnight into day. 
I am here for you this evening uh, representing Mr. James Baldwin. This is a transcript from James Baldwin's debate with William F. Buckley, 1965. I remember, for example, when the ex-Attorney General, Mr. Robert Kennedy, said that it was inconceivable that in 40 years in America, we might have a Negro president. That sounded like a very emancipated statement, I suppose, to white people. They were not in Harlem when this statement was first heard, and they're not here, and possibly will never hear the laughter and the bitterness and the scorn with which this statement was greeted. From the point of view of the man in the Harlem barbershop, Bobby Kennedy only got here yesterday and He's already on his way to the presidency. We've been here for 400 years. And now he tells us that maybe in 40 years, if you're good, we may let you become president. <laughs> what is dangerous here is the turning away from the turning away from anything any white American says. The reason for the politician or the political hesitation in spite of the Johnson landslide is that one has been betrayed by American politicians for so long and I am a grown man and perhaps I can be reasoned with. I certainly hope I can be but I don't know and neither does Martin Luther King, none of us know how to deal with those other people whom the white world has so long ignored, who don't believe anything the white world says and don't entirely believe anything I or Martin is saying. And one can, can't blame them. You watch what has happened to them in less than 20 years. It seems to me that the city of New York, for example, this is my last point. It had Negroes in it for a very long time. In the city of New York, we were able, as it has indeed been able, in the last 15 years to reconstruct itself, tear down buildings, and raise great new ones downtown and for money, and has done nothing whatever except build housing projects in the ghettos for the Negroes. And of course, Negroes hate it. Presently, the property does indeed deteriorate, deteriorate because the children cannot bear it. They want to get out of the ghetto. If the American pretensions were based on more solid or a more honest assessment of life and of themselves, it would not mean for Negroes when someone says Ur urban renewal that Negroes can simply are going to be thrown into the streets. This is just what it does mean now. This is not an act of God when dealing with a society made and ruled by men. Had the American Negro had not been present in America, I'm convinced the history of the American labor movement would be much more edifying than it is. It is a terrible thing for an entire people to surrender to the notion that one ninth of its population is beneath them. 
And until that moment, until the moment comes when we, the Americans, we, the American people, are able to accept the fact that I have to accept, for example, that my ancestors are both black and white. That, on that continent, we are trying to forge a new identity for which we need each other, and that I am not a ward of America. I am not an object of missionary charity. I am yeah. one of the people yeah. who built the country. Until this moment, there is scarcely any hope for the American dream, because the people who are denied participation in it by their very presence will wreck it. And if that happens, it is a very grave moment for the West. Ladies and gentlemen, James Baldwin. Yeah. Oh, come on, keep clapping your hands. Mr. James Baldwin. My Luce. I, I knew better to get up here after Jocelyn <laughs> tried to wreck us like that. But deep down in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. Oh, you, you were too silent right there. I'll say it again. Deep down in my heart, I do believe that we shall, uh, we shall overcome someday. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. See, I told y'all y'all were going to get me in trouble tonight. I, I didn't mean for that to slip out, but I do believe that we shall overcome. The same, while we're here at this moment, we might as well have this moment, right? While we're right here, because the same God that kept us through the transatlantic um, slave passage uh, or slave trade, through the middle passage, the African diaspora, hallelujah, chattel slavery, and all of the like, is the same God who's keeping us right now. Uh, the, 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 the same God who kept us while we were holes Closed in the south and ghettoed in the north. It's the same God who's keeping us right now. And so deep down in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome. So I'll just cry, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Had some hard days, but thank you, Lord. Had some tears to cry, but thank you, Lord. Had some midnight hours, but thank you, Lord. We shall overcome someday. I'm sorry, I just had to do that for me. And I know we're recording tonight, but hallelujah. I'm, I, she, she did it. it Blame Jocelyn. It was, her, it was her fault. Hallelujah. Nevertheless, let's get back to our script tonight. <laughs> Woo! I just, had, I just had to get it out. I just had to get it out. <laughs> the Honorable Donnie Tuck, Mayor of the City of Hampton, is going to join us by way of video for a more perfect union presented by the President Barack Obama and his 2008 speech. Controversial remarks by the Reverend Jeremiah Wright, pastor of the Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, Illinois, where Barack Obama had been a member emerged as a lingering issue in the 2008 presidential campaign. On March 18, 2008, the then Senator Obama delivered a now famous speech on race at the Constitution Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, called a more perfect union by his campaign. Obama's oration excuse me, was designed to address the pastor's remarks and his relationship with the minister. Just as important, the speech also addressed the role of race throughout the nation's history and during the 2008 presidential campaign. The Montgomery bus boycott, led in part by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., was the first major event in the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, and the U.S. civil rights leaders such as Megar Everts, Malcolm X, Reverend Jesse Jackson and many more became household names. Their fight for freedom changed the landscape for African Americans and brought about great change. Sadly, the fight for freedom still continues. There are many organizations and groups such as the NAACP, Black Lives Matter, uh, and many others. We also have individuals such as James Rucker and along with CNN's Vance Jones of the online activist resource Color of Change, Rucker has helped to create the largest modern civil rights organization in the United States. 
Color of Change, which has an estimated 7 million members. Reverend Dr. Barber, William Barber is the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a social justice and anti-poverty organization based on the last wave of the last civil rights movement started by Dr. King. There are many other people and organizations that have taken on the fight in the past and in continuing now. Music has also been the voice of change and regardless of what you think about hip hop, there are artists that picked up the cause and now carry the torch of freedom. We share, we share, and later on after mayor, we will share an interview where these hip hop giants are fighting the cause today from that 2021 interview. First, we shall hear from the Honorable Mayor Tuck, uh, a more perfect union, and then we shall hear excerpts of this hip hop movement and interview from Andre Rashad, uh, Luce, Anthony Beeman and Candace St. Clair. I believe I got them all in that order. All right, there we go. Donnie, Donnie Tuck, Tuck, Mayor of the City of Hampton, Hampton Virginia. Virginia. We, we the people, people in order to form a more perfect union, union 221, 221 years, years ago, in a hall that still stands across the street, a group of men gathered and, with these simple words, launched America's improbable experiment in democracy. Farmers and scholars, statesmen and patriots, who had traveled across an ocean to escape tyranny and persecution, finally made real their Declaration of Independence at a Philadelphia convention that lasted through the spring of 1787. The document they produced was eventually signed, but ultimately unfinished. It was stained by this nation's original sin of slavery, a question that divided the colonies and brought the convention to a stalemate until the founders chose to allow the slave trade to continue for at least 20 more years and to leave any final resolution to future generations. Of course, the answer to the slavery question was already embedded within our Constitution, a Constitution that had at its very core the ideal of equal citizenship under the law a constitution that promised its people liberty and justice and a union that could be and should be perfected over time. And yet words on a parchment paper would not be enough to deliver slaves from bondage or provide men and women of every color and creed their full rights and obligations as citizens of the United States. What would be needed were Americans in successive generations who were willing to do their part through protests and struggles, on the streets and in the courts, through a civil war and civil disobedience, and always at great risk to narrow that gap between the promise of our ideals and the reality of their time. This was one of the tasks we set forth at the beginning of this presidential campaign, to contain the long march of those who came before us, a march for a more just, more equal, more free, more caring, and more prosperous America. I chose to run for president at this moment in history because I believe deeply that we cannot solve the challenges of our time unless we solve them together, unless we perfect our union by understanding that we may have different stories, but we hold common hopes, that we may not look the same, and we may not have come from the same place, but we all want to move in the same direction toward a better future for our children and our grandchildren. Good evening. My name is Andre Rashad. I'm going to be doing um, a poem that I co-wrote with um, the late great legend himself, Levi. Y'all know him as Matthew St. Clair. Um, yes, sir. It was some ums over here because they heard his poems in person. <laughs> but um, um, the poem is called The Pain. It's going to outline what our people suffered through. The sun, it won't shine. The tears in my eyes, they fall when I cry. They say the rain won't pour, the sun won't shine. I try to hide 
the tears in my eyes, the tears in my eyes, they fall when I cry. The sun, it won't shine, the tears in my eyes, they fall when I cry. They say the rain gon' pour, the sun won't shine, I try to hide. The tears in my eyes, the tears in my eyes, they fall when I cry. I think about this slavery every day. My brothers kill each other, people trying to find a way. They put in green over family, St. Patrick's Day, but brothers with the bread don't help the hood, they just run away. They got us always on a move, we feeling scared to settle. Generational curses are just strings attached, like young Geppetto. They in the driver's seat, the foot can't reach the pedal, blind leading the blind and pot calling on the kettle. But what's the chances for a young brother when we black? And when he innocent, 12 pretended he was strapped. They killing off my people trying to start a revolution, they looking for a reason. Any reason they gonna start shooting. In my community, we fight the slavery on both sides. Policing and then the thiefing, brothers be their own demise. It's devils everywhere, they politicians in disguise, and in these lowest days, we just sing these songs and lift our eyes. How long do we gotta wait for our people to see that we gonna be the chosen? I'm tired of waking up every day alone, praying the rest of my people get woken. I, I wrote this poem the same day they released that movie about Fred Hampton and Beamer, excuse me, assassinated, just to clarify it further. I can, I can name a list from Christ to Malcolm to Dr. King. Every generation they try to silence us from singing our song, but we still sing. It's because we the salt to the earth, the chosen. We bring a deeper meaning. But this, is, this poem is only a fragment of our thoughts, living in a fragment of freedom. Thank you. Today you released Bullets, a song that speaks on racism. What inspired you to collaborate, and why did you specifically want it released on Juneteenth? Back on the mic. So um, we the collective, you know what I'm saying? Myself, Chuck D, Public Enemy, Daddy O. I'm officially called Night Train for those who you know about Night Train. Um, we released a song entitled Bullets, and it was a remix, and it was to address racism, you know, police brutality, um, and unfairness in the community, of course. The song, the song and the collective was inspired by the ideology, ideology for the black struggle. You know what I'm saying? Um, others, others march, we rap. That's what we do, you feel me? And you know, the songs be nice too. But, but, <laughs> but, <Word>. but <laughs> others march, we rap. And um, we're releasing it on Juneteenth to just commemorate the awareness of freedom. That's what's up. Daddy-o. You? <laughs> what made you want to enlist Chuck D in speech for this remix of yours? Word, Daddy-o speaking. The reason I... I chose Chuck D of Public Enemy and Speech of Arrested Development is because I always felt that the three of us were hip hop prophets. Now, from Stetsasonics, freedom, of de freedom or Death, to Arrested Developments, Everyday People, y'all remember? Yes. Yeah. Yes. To Public Enemies Fight the Power, yeah. our messages have clearly been seen. Now, sometimes we the resistance, sometimes we fight the resistance. Either way, we voice what the people feel and what they breathe, you know what I mean? Did I say breathe? Yeah, breathe. <laughs> okay, so how has music, specifically rap, served as a form of advocacy for racial injustice within black and brown communities? Mm. I mean, hip hop 
itself and rap specifically has always been a form of advocacy in, in the racial against racial injustice, of course, mm -hmm. in the black and brown communities. Um, and it's, it's, it's simple to see, like being, you can hear it anywhere. Like local block parties, clubs, even even on the radio, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Certain radio stations, of course, but rap music has always been the voice of our people since the beginning. Speak on it. No, no. Yes. So yes. how has rap music served as a prediction tool for protests, sort of like calling out that history has been repeating itself? Hip hop has always been very adamant about telling the stories of our communities, from NWA and Public Enemy mm. to Kendrick Lamar and Vic Menza. How have you seen the shift in the music industry since the deaths of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and obviously so many more to list? Too many more Shockingly, the shift in the music industry has been awkwardly stopped. Where? But that's not to blame on the music industry, yeah. that's to blame on us rappers here. No, facts, 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 that's a fact. Do you believe that music artists with large platforms have a responsibility to speak up during these times? Especially those who rise to fame has been in the hands of black culture. Of, of course, it's simply the dope thing to do. Ducking from a responsibility is usually a child excuse. Mm. That's what's up, Chuck. Definitely, look, I believe artists with high degrees of what is labeled as social currency should speak up. That's us, fam. No, facts. To that effort, I begun a production called Self Destruction 2 to involve young artists to address the pain. Oh, wow. The pain and the pain was earlier. So that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking up is important. And it's not just important, sometimes it's important all the time. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. And um, those with a huge reach should not only speak up, but they should also uplift the grassroots organizations that's actually doing the work out here in the fields. Word. Because now we can make those the influencers, and the influencers are doing the work. Okay, so each of you are known for your activism in the black communities. What sparked your specific interest in being vocal? That's a good question. Thank you. I, I think I can take that one. Um, honestly, uh, I was born in 1960, and the turbulence decade as a child, it was a normal thing adults did. And I had young parents who spoke out, and they always encouraged me, as well as my brothers and sisters, to do the same. I feel you, daddy-o, daddy-o speaking. Chuck, I feel you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I saw our children being misled and influenced by outside entities. Big time. I felt like if I had a voice, I needed to use it to educate the next generation. You know, the little ones, like y'all right here. All right, in the 70s, the artists like Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, yeah. James Brown, y'all yeah. know who they are? They helped our community to not only cope, but actually offer solutions and suggestions for our pain. Now, I often say today that television has replaced the record player mm -hmm. in the back home or in the black home. Mm -hmm. Later, becoming a rapper with Stetson Sonic, I provided those answers right through my own music. And I'm not as smooth as Daddy O, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, it's, it's a smooth dude right there. <laughs> speak on his piece. Play the keys too. <laughs> my, see, but my parents was activists. You know what I'm saying? Uh, my mother, she owned the largest black newspaper in Wisconsin. It was called the Milwaukee um, Community Journal. Mm -hmm. And um, so during my childhood, we not only at the breakfast table discussed these kind of issues, we talked about the possibility of solutions too. Where? So it was putting me as a, since childhood, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for anyone who may not feel like their platform is large enough to be heard? Mm. Where can someone start if they don't know how? That sounds like a truck question. That's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Every person <laughs> can start with something. But people should start one at a time, even with themselves. The burden of world change shouldn't be on the shoulders of one person or mind. Mm -hmm. In fact, how can one person change the world if they can't even change their own mind? Cool. That's true. Facts. That's cool. That's a fact. Big fact. This was a snap with that one. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be real. I personally, I don't know, but spe speaking about social media, I think the problem with social media is like a data overload. You got these algorithms, you know what I'm saying? You got um, these algorithms, they become gatekeepers and filters. Mm -hmm. mm. So it's hard for the truth to get out under those circumstances. And honestly, I, I worry about the truth but being able to spread under these type of scenarios. That's cool. So recently, Republic Records announced that it would remove the word urban mm. from their verbiage for departments, urban. music genres, and employee titles. Define. What are your thoughts on this motion in the music industry? I got this. All right, so <laughs> although the music industry, the music business will be making small changes, like 
Republic Records recently erasing the name Urban from their verbiage and the head of Reddit stepping down and suggesting that a black person take that position. The responsibility, the true responsibility is ours as individual artists, managers, and producers. You feel me? The term urban was a cultural cancer to the black ownerships anyway. Notice urban music still promoted and presented black artists, mm. but they all were under some like corporate plantations. Facts. Be it record companies or radio <clears throat> field stations. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's keep it 100. I've always hated the term. It's like, what does that even mean? I'm, gonna be honest. I'm still trying to figure like, it out. Define it. You can, right. Like, define it. We got urban dictionary just to define urban, but anyway. <laughs> 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 I've always hated the term because it, it dilutes the diversity of the, and the power of black music. Because the reality is this, not all black music is urban. Facts. And not all, all urban music comes from black areas. Say so. That is a good, that's a very good point you, you know, made there. I'm just trying to speak facts. As yes, I, I understand. You know mm -hmm. So how can music be used as a tool for healing during this era of COVID-19, since it's cop killings and protests? You said COVID-19, right? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Although COVID-19 has slowed people down, we damn. <laughs> our ears, our minds, they still work, right? Yes. We just believe that it's time to listen, like now. That's big. Um, and, and you know what, music, the snaps, I appreciate that. The, music gives inspiration and direction, you know what I'm saying? It, it helps people with their worldview and it cue points for people striving to understand and make sense of the world we live in, you mm. know what I'm saying? And, um, it, it also happens to be black, one of black people's biggest ex exports. Yes. So um, if we don't use our music to heal, the reality of the matter is they will use various medium, mediums to destroy us even more. Mm -hmm. That's what's up. That's very true. If you write speech, if we don't use it to bring us together, they're going to use it to tear us apart. Mm. Mm. Yes, you're very smart. But um, I always felt like a good curation and teaching of music is necessary in the USA. And the storylines are loaded with historical fact, reflection, and timelines. Teaching people towards the quantity and quality of black music could save you from being stuck in their heads. In fact, all music can teach. The 60s were an amazing platform. In fact, the 60s was huge. Well, there you have it. Thank you, Chuck D, Daddy O, and Speech. You. This was a powerful interview. Yeah. Let's all continue to fight yeah. the power. <laughs> fight the power. Y'all give it up for Daddy O again. You don't have to. That was an excellent presentation, and what a wonderful challenge it is to all of us, um, because we all can do something. And if we don't know what to do, then we should all lift our voice and sing. Amen. We need to sing until both heaven and earth ring with freedoms of liberties. And so I'm going to invite you to stand at this time right before our intermission. We're going to sing at least the first stanza of Lift Every Voice and Sing. If you don't know the words, you can use your smartphone tonight. Go ahead and pull it up. Google it while I'm talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm giving you your cue right now while I'm talking. Go ahead and pull it up. Right after this, we will have a seven minute intermission mission their snacks drinks for sale as well and be back in your seats okay in seven minutes everybody say seven seven say it one more time seven seven we're gonna oh, be seven. back in our seats in seven minutes Check. all right who's gonna lead us oh i'm not okay lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of birds sing. rejoicing, rise high as the listing skies, let every sound loud as the rolling sea sing a song full of the faith that the dark passes sing a song full 
love, the hope that the presence has brought. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. That it is home till victory is won. <laughs> All right, in seven minutes, don't forget to check out the bar that's outside. There's drinks, soft drinks, and beer for sale, as well as some refreshments. Be back for your seat in seven minutes, please. Uh, oh, yes, after this, we're going to acknowledge Black Music Month um, by having a concert. So you want to be back here. Don't leave. There's a short concert right after intermission. And right after intermission, we'll have a short concert in honor of Black Music Mom. <laughs> hey, look, I'm glad we didn't do that second verse. Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 I mean, come on. Stony the Road, we try. Bit of the chest, we try. I'm going to need y'all to know these words now. <laughs> right. Hey, speaking of which, this, this poem you just delivered, what are you doing on Sunday morning? <laughs> What time? 10.30. You, you booked, I'm sure. I, well, I'm a musician in my church. Oh, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm Woo. Drummer, I'm drummer. Okay, gotcha. Okay, gotcha. But, but, um, yeah, I would love for that to be a part of, I mean, because it's Father's Day and yeah. Juneteenth, so I'm trying to mirror the two, and then when you did that, I was like, oh, that's genius. Y'all start at 10.30? We do. I'm, I'm going to talk to my pastor. We start at 10 o'clock. That's the only thing. You can't be old. Where I'm, you at? So, um, downtown, if I'm going to Oh, and I'm in Norfolk. You're in Norfolk. Oh, well, that ain't going to work. Yeah. I, I, appreciate I appreciate you, though. We'll get you another time. Are you on Instagram, bro? Yes. HJM757. I'm going to get your number and your Instagram. Okay, cool. Yes, sir. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, Right, right. Tear the church up. Then we, then we gotta go up there. We gotta go up there and do an interview after the show. I know. That was dope, though. I actually did that. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. You know, you know Chuck was killing it. was a good break, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it was a nice little break, didn't it?
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Preach. Oh, no, 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 Yeah, I saw you get on the keys. I said, okay. No, no, no. no. You don't really do keys. Okay, okay, okay. I'm on the keys, and that's the piano player there. Got you. I'm that good at the keys. That's the first drum. Now, what church you go to? You didn't tell me anything. So, um, the, um, so it's, it's, it's two churches, but the one I grew up in is called the Pride Baptist Church. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. Okay. Okay, gotcha. On Saturdays, gotcha. I'm up in Pittsburgh with the um, Baptist Christ Church. Okay, okay. 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 I do want something. Go get me some. Is it good? It's okay. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm go get me something too.
Thank you. I want to thank everybody right now because after we finish this part of the uh, program, um, y'all are going to be ready to go home. First of all, I want to thank you all so much for coming out on a Monday night and being here. You know, when I, we've been so busy putting things together and making changes, and then I started to think, well, what if no one comes? <laughs> but you did, and we are very, very grateful. I've judged how this program was going by you. When you looked happy, I was like, this is good. <laughs> when you clapped your hands, I said, this is good. So you were my, yeah, I measured things by you. I need you to cover all my stuff so I'll know how we're doing. I would like to thank uh, so many people, but like I said, I'm going to do it now so I don't have to hold you later. I would like to thank this wonderful group of individuals who I am so blessed to know. Some of them are my sons, my S-U-N. Um, as uh, Andre Richard mentioned earlier, there's a song. He was writing a writing partner with um, another young man who just happened to be my S-O-N. And his name was Matthew, is, his name is Matthew St. Clair. And uh, Matthew passed in January. But these SUNs have been by my side, have still come to visit me, make sure I'm okay. Tyler, that's another one of my sons, wave your hand like this. My SUNs. And Jada, hi Jada. Um, so I want to thank, make sure I do this correctly. This young man is professionally the outreach education director of the American Theater. His name is Hugo Morrison. <laughs> but you got to see another side of him tonight because he's also pastor Hugo Morrison. You can tell that one. You can tell that. Beside him is Mr. Luce, who is a phenomenal actor, keyboardist, just all around great guy. I asked his daughter, I said, is your daddy always this nice? And she said, yeah. <laughs> Deidre, you two are just dynamic. And um, next time, you'll be on the stage. <laughs> um, this is my beautiful sister, Deborah Harris. <laughs> the song that we sang, um, Actually, I started it last year, and this year I put an actual verse to it, so it's an original song. But I'm not a, a singer like that, so Debbie, I said, can you do something with this song? And I think she did a fantastic job. So thank you, Debbie. I'm not sure where Candace is. Candace is my daughter, she's all right. <laughs> And there's Miss Jeannie Mosley. Um, you're going to meet her in a few minutes. She is going to bless you with a little bit of music. And where's Mr. Anthony Bigman? Did he leave? Anthony was the young man up here with the glasses. This is his, was his first time acting tonight. And I, I think he did a wonderful job. So if you see him, let him know. Because, you know, once you do something good, I'm going to pull you in for everything. And last but not least is one of the most magnificent people I have come to know. He is my SUN. He is one of the two goats, greatest of all times. <laughs> he has a wonderful uh, music career that he's pushing out there and doing great things. And you get to hear some of his music tonight as well. And this is none other than Mr. Andre Richard. <laughs> I would like to thank National Park Service, Fort Monroe Authority, and the wonderful, wonderful Hampton History Museum. Seamus and Lucy just do an, an, an outstanding job. And what I love about them is that I can come to them and I can say, well, what about this? And they go, OK. You know, we'll see. And it's kind of good to be able to work with that kind of thing. My business is called Fragments of Freedom. And what I love to do is share our history, share our history. So I'm very grateful and honored to have them as partners. And I'm, I know you're, I said your name, Al, 
Starts with Alan. I thank Alan for running that sound and doing that video stuff, and he was all over the place. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Calvin Pearson, for being out tonight. Mr. Calvin Pearson is the di executive director, creator, founder of Project 1619. It is an honor to have you in the house. And in August, on August what date? August 27th, and it's at Fort Monroe? Okay, Fort Monroe, every year he does a phenomenal program to celebrate our beginning. And so if you can, please come out and experience that because it will be great. Okay, do I need to thank anybody else? I thank you, 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 and you. I am grateful. Okay, so we're going to just have them one behind another. It's Black Music Appreciation Month. How y'all doing? I'm talking to you, Mr. Robert, right? Was I right? Yeah, in the white shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, David's sister, how you doing? And David's sister's daughter. Hi, baby. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna stop now. All right, so it's Black Music Appreciation Month, and what we did is we're just gonna have a little music. It's not necessarily collected or in a theme, it's just some music that these artists were kind enough to bring to the stage. Each person's gonna do two songs, and then we can go home. Okay, next year we're gonna have an outstanding Black Music Appreciation Month, so just watch out for that. All right, first to the stage is none other than Miss Deborah Harris. She will be followed by Miss Jeannie Mosley and Mr. Andre Richard, the GOAT, will close us out. <laughs> Thank you all again for coming. God bless you all. My sister took my paper, so I'm gonna have to wing it. I pray that I can. I pray that you pray with me. I chose Mahalia Jackson. She's an icon from way back in the day, but her music never grows old. And I am gonna do this a cappella, but if you wanna join me, you surely can. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me Let me stand, I am tired, I am weak, and I am worn, through the storm, through the night. Lead me on to the light, precious Lord. Take my hand and lead me right on home. Soon I will be done with the trouble of this world. The trouble of this world. The trouble of this world. Soon I will be done with the trouble of this world. Going home to be with my Lord no more weeping and wailing no more weeping and wailing no more weeping and wailing go home with my Lord. Soon I will be done 
with the trouble of this world the trouble of this world the trouble of this world soon i will be done with the troubles of this world going home to be with my Lord. Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good time. Great. Um, the first song I'm going to sing had um, is actually been designed based on the the uh, poem, the, the a poem by uh, Maya Angelou, "Phenomenal Woman." Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. Oh, I say it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips. The stride in my step, the curl on my lips. I'm a woman, yeah. phenomenal woman. Whoa, I'm a woman, baby. That's me. I walk into a room just as cool as you please. And to a man, the fellas stand, then they fall down on their knees. And then they swarm around me like a hive of honeybees. Oh, I say it's in the fire in my eyes, the flash of my teeth, the swing of my waist, and the joy in my feet. I'm, I'm a woman, phenomenal woman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm a woman, yeah. Oh, baby, that's me. It's in the arch of my back, the sun on my smile, the right of my high breast, the grace of my Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So now you understand just why my head's not bowed. See, I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. But when you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. Oh, I say it's enough. Click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care. Cause I'm a woman, oh, phenomenal woman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm a woman. Oh, oh, baby, that's me. It's in the palm of my hand and the need for my care. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal woman, yeah. Baby, 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 that's me. It's me. Yeah. For every phenomenal woman out here tonight, God bless you. Okay, I've got one more. This is an adaptation of jazz version of Wade in the Water. Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Who's that a young girl dressed in red? Wait in the water. Must be the children that Moses led. Oh, God's going to trouble the water. Well, wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Yeah. Yes. Who's that young girl dressed in blue? Wait in the water. It must be the children that's coming through. Oh, God's going to trouble the water. Well, wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. <laughs> Who's that young girl dressed in blue? Wait in the water. It must be the children that's coming through. Oh, God's going to trouble the water. Well, 
Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Well, you don't believe I've been redeemed. Wait in the water. Must be the Holy Ghost looking for me. God's gonna trouble the water. Oh, wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Well. How y'all doing? I'm um I'm so I'm doing two legends. I'm the first one is gonna be Reverend James Cleveland. Yeah yeah. So somebody know who he is. <laughs> I don't feel no way he's tired. But that's that's a, that's a, that's a group song though, so I can't sing that by myself. And then after that, we're gonna do um Sam Cook. Check it. There we go. Y'all ready? I don't. Y'all thought I was going high. Feel <laughs> no waste time. Y'all sing with us. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. And I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. There we go. I don't feel no waste time. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. Don't believe he brought me this far. I don't believe. There we go. He brought me this far. I don't believe he brought me this far. I don't believe he brought me. Come on, y'all. I don't believe. He brought me this far. I don't believe he brought me this far. I don't believe he brought me the I had a high note. <laughs> I don't believe he brought me this far. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. <laughs> Thank y'all. <laughs> I just want to get a crowd into it. That's all I want to do. Now I'm going to try to actually sing for y'all if, if I can get this to play. Oh, you know what? Yes, sir.
Please forgive me, y'all. Give me one moment. While I'm trying to get the Bluetooth, um, I was going to tell y'all um, the story that Miss St. Clair was telling y'all earlier. Um, rest in peace to Levi. You know, his stage name was Levi. That's, that stood for love, every valuable in, um, instant. And um, Levi was a poet, for those who know him. He, he also was my brother, which makes Miss St. Clair like my mother. And um, he told us a lot about music. He told us a lot about putting your all into music and your heart into music and your soul into music. His mother is the whole reason we make music today. And um, before Levi passed, the album me and him made together, um, the first one reached over a million plays on Spotify. And the, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> I was born by the river yeah. in a little tent and door, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know that change gon' come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too hard living. I'm not afraid to die, because I know my God is up there beyond the sky it's been a long a long time coming but i know that change gonna come oh yes it will if y'all know what y'all can sing it i go to the movies and i'll go downtown Somebody keep telling me don't hang around. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know that change gon' come. Oh, yes, it will. Then I go to my brother. And I'll say, brother, help me please. But he winds up knocking me down. Back down on my high knees. Oh, there's been times when I thought I could last for long, but now I think I'm able to carry on. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know that change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Thank you. Oh, you're not getting up there. <laughs> Definitely. Guess what? That's it. Thank you all for coming out. Be safe. Be safe. Be safe. We love you. We appreciate you. Come back next time. <laughs> Let's hear it from Ms. Marie.